So as mentioned, uh, I'll be talking a little bit about Syria, about the Syria conflict mapping project, and really um, about uh, a major paradigm shift that we've seen in terms of the information that's available and the technology that's out there. It's sort of in between what Terry and Coleman were talking about. You know, in, in Terry's line of work, at Sparks and Honey, you can get data streams coming in real time. You can get all the, the click streams. You can get massive, massive amounts of information. Um, but then in, in different contexts, in, in conflict zones or in, in crisis zones, getting information has historically been a very, very big problem. You need to have people on the ground, you need to have some corroborating sources of information. Now, uh, with the advent of, um, well, social media and digital technology, there are new opportunities arising for engaging in these, these very difficult situations. Now, it, back in January 2012, um, I was an intern at the Carter Center, and I was tasked with the not-so-enviable job of just figuring out what was going on in Syria. Um, and so between flipping back and forth between work and Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and things like that, I quickly found that um, my friends, you know, I, I grew up um, most of my life in, in the Middle East, M my friends were posting a whole bunch of things on, on social media, on, on Facebook and on YouTube, which uh, not only was the information better than what was coming through traditional media and reports and, and, and um, think tanks, uh, but it was, it was just way more plentiful. And, and early on in, in the conflict, I started noticing um, videos coming out of defectors. You started to see Twitter accounts coming up of armed groups in Syria. So you know, what, that begs the question, what does an armed group in Syria want to talk about on Twitter? Who do they follow? Who follows them? It's all publicly available information, and it's the sort of thing that you can download. And, and after a while uh, of working on this and, and recording all the defectors that I could and trying to plot where they were defecting from, what was going on in the country, um, you started seeing videos like this one. Um, I'll, I'll read in case you can all see it. This is a, a formal prayer introduction, fairly standardized, though there's some differences between um, here he gets into it. We are a group of battalions of the Free Army present in northern and western Aleppo and a group of battalions from the city of Anadan. We announce the formation of the Martyrs of Anadan Brigade and enroll it in the military council in Aleppo uh, and its countryside. Um, and this is in response to the, the crimes that Assad and his cronies have committed against the people. We will operate in Aleppo in particular in Syria in general, until the fall of the murderous regime. Long live Syria free and proud, and victory to its proud people. Like three guys at the end didn't get the memo on how many chants they were going to do. <clears throat> but uh, so in this video, you saw a large group of people, you can count the number of PEDs uh, that you see. You see that they've got a, a T-55 tank, a couple of um, RPGs. Some of them are in uniform, some of them are in civilian clothing. They said the name of the town uh, where they were forming in the area that they were forming in. If you look on satellite imagery, you can see a partially built housing structure in that exact same area. You can pinpoint where it was filmed. Um, and, and so we started collecting this. Uh, we got together a team of researchers that were already working on trying to collect some of them, and we, we enabled them more. And um, to date, we've recorded about 7,000 armed groups forming in Syria. Now, they're not all independent groups. As, as this one mentioned, in this video, we got two different group names. We got the name of the group and the name of the group that it was part of. He's saying, we're enrolling ourselves in the military council in Aleppo and its countryside. So regardless of whether or not the military council in Aleppo and its countryside have announced themselves in the same way, oftentimes we get that sort of information. Um, up to about 70 different attributes for all of these, including whether the video's been edited or not, and, and all the different types of, of weapons or equipment that we might see. Now, writing a little bit of code, we managed to put this together into this. So this dot, oh, second, third, fourth, these are, this is a time lapse of armed group formations in Aleppo. Uh, we've actually done this for the, the whole country, not just for Aleppo, but 
Um, I'll show you the whole country one and you'll see why I didn't, uh, didn't visualize it like this. So each dot is an armed group. The larger dots um, and the darker colored dots are groups that are more central to the overall network. Um, and the first thing a lot of people say when, when we look at this is, oh, it looks like cells dividing. Exactly. It is just as organic as that. These are human networks. These are all being announced um, via YouTube. Obviously, you know, we're not collecting everything. But if everybody's talking about everything around them, then it's like little sonar pings. And we can start to uncover some of these networks. Now, at the time that we were doing this, I met with a commander of an armed group in, um, along the border in Turkey. And, uh, and he claimed to be in control of 70% of the armed factions in Syria. Well, if you start looking at these sorts of networks, if you start looking at you know, who's operating where and all of these different groups, it's, it's total BS. It's not true. It can't possibly be true. Not even 70% of the groups are connected. Um, so then who is he actually in charge of? Who does he actually speak for? What is the scope of that organization? And how do we get that information to the mediators? How do we get that information to the people that are doing something about it? Uh, by the way, this is what the overall network looked like. Um, this is just the first two, uh, two years of the conflict, right? So now w things have just continued. The information coming out has just continued and continued and continued. Luckily, we've seen some consolidation of, information, uh, of these groups. Since um, November of 2012, groups in Syria have increasingly joined up with each other. Until now, you've got about 100 big fish in, in the country. And most of those groups, the most of those hundred major groups, operate under a couple of different umbrellas. They're, they're fairly cohesive to the point that you, know, you can have a, a mediation team of these groups present in Geneva now that, that most people in Syria consider to be representative and it has actual power to engage. Um, now they might not be able to engage completely at the local level, you're gonna have other spoils, spoilers and you're gonna to have to know who these people are. But in order to translate this amount of information and make it useful to people on the ground meant that we had to start developing some new tools. We couldn't just look at uh, social network analyses. We couldn't just look at how all of these armed groups are connected because see all these individual dots in the center, those are groups that formed and were never heard from again. They, they didn't link up with any other group. They never popped up on our radar so are they still active? Should we just remove them from our list? What we started doing in the beginning is we, um, we gave each of these groups a half-life. And if they didn't continuously appear, and if they weren't referenced in other armed group formations, if they didn't come through our database, then they were marked as inactive automatically. And so we could start, start sorting through a whole bunch uh, more information, but as the number of new armed group formations started slowing down, so did our signal on which groups were really active. And we had to expand from just looking at armed group formations and relations to look at armed group formations and relations and conflict events and link those events to the groups themselves. And eventually that grew again and again and again. We now track five different aspects of the conflict. Um, armed group formations, conflict events, sightings of sophisticated weaponry, because we started to understand some patterns of what weapons we were seeing in the hands of some groups and not in the hands of other groups and how those weapons flowed through the country and, and so on and so forth. And then two other aspects which are supplementing our social media based analysis and that is assessments of humanitarian living conditions and the movement of internally displaced people. And those come from networks of contacts on the ground in Syria who we do not solicit or accept information related to the military side of the conflict, but more than willing to share info about the availability of humanitarian aid in that area, if they're being reached or not, if there are internally displaced people. And it actually serves as a corroborating source of information for us. Now, in order to get this out to people, what we've done is we've started developing new tools. Now, being an NGO, and not a particularly tech-savvy NGO, we are led by a 91-year-old former president, um, nuclear physicist, he's, he's quite tech savvy, but still, we needed to partner with others. Um, we partnered with Palantir Technologies, uh, sorry, Palantir Technologies, in order to visualize all of this data that we're getting. And so we didn't have to have it on some GIS system and then social network analysis and whatever else. And um, started putting together some of these tools. This is publicly available. This is a, on our website. Each dot is a city or town 
in Syria, and it's been coded by who controls it. You know, if you, if you gather enough evidence of force-on-force uh, -force clashes, all of those clashes will start making a line. You can see where the front lines are. You can see which side's being aerial, you know, receiving aerial bombardments and things like that. You can determine the front lines just by plotting together all the videos and, and conflict reports that you get. Once we did that, we coded all the communities on one side or the other by who controls it. And any time a new event comes through our system, which is a, a location capture event, it auto-updates it. So you can, you can go online now, you can look at this, you can scroll backwards and forwards through time and see how everything changes. Um, and that's great, it's a nice visualization. But how do we, uh, again, make this more actionable? These maps are, are certainly useful for a mediator or an analyst in understanding general trends of the conflict, but to get really down to the, the local level, uh, we made a couple of different ones. So this is uh, an early warning system that we've been developing in coordination with some of our humanitarian partners. And, and what it does is it looks specifically for trends. So we collect information from uh, the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights. You've probably heard them referenced in news articles. Um, as many different videos as we can. And we've been developing new tools for that. I can talk about those in, in a second as well. Again, we get information on conflict um, when we hear of displacements of civilians. And, uh, and more and more and more. Putting it all together, if there's a notable increase in conflict in one place, if a new area receives aerial bombardments or something like that, then, uh, then we can create an alert. And that's what this is here. So this is from uh, the 20th of April. And the alert that was created was around Aleppo City. Um, it's here, it's this green dot. By clicking on it, it shows you all the conflict events within 10 kilometers. Shows you a timeline of, again, this is just what's in our database, supplementing what other people are doing as well. Um, it's not perfect information. It's an imperfect reflection of what's available online. But still, you can start seeing where things have been happening, where the increase was. And then up here in the left, uh, or um, your right, this is the um, uh, visualization of our data on past civilian displacements. So these trends that we're looking for are things that we have and our partners have noted um, preceding internally displaced people movements. So if, if there's an increase in some place, this looks like similar increases we've seen before, this looks like past displacements. Well, where did everyone from this area flee to in the past? The red dot is where our alert is, and this heat map shows where people have fled from and to. So if you're gonna pre-position some humanitarian aid, this can help you in making those decisions, just being able to visualize all the data that we've seen in the past and then project forwards. More recently, um, it's a little bit washed out here, but this is a close-up of Aleppo City um, ceasefire violations last week. Um, they're color-coded according to the initiator, the primary initiator of, of conflict in that area. Now, already you can start to see a bit of a pattern. We've got opposition, green initiated attacks in this part of the city, um, and government initiated attacks in this part of the city over here and on the top. And if I go back, looking at Aleppo City, this word close up here, that's more or less along the front lines. Um, and it's also a little bit of a heat map. So the intensity of color of some of these things represents repeated instances in the same area. Um, and that's something that we're, we're trying to do now. We've been working on the political side of things, and we've also been working on the conflict analysis side of things. Now those two are really coming together because a lot of the political progress that has been made or is starting to be made in Syria now is contingent upon the continued success of this ceasefire, of this cessation of hostilities. So if we can, again, supplement what other people are already doing, by collecting new information, uh, information from social media, developing new tools to, um, to analyze it, and contribute that to the overall process, then hopefully we can lead to, uh, we can contribute to a more effective and more responsive ceasefire monitoring task force. We can pressure the parties that are responsible for some of these violations and uh, salvage a peace process, if, if possible. One of these new tools and again, I mentioned you know, we tried to partner with people because we wanted to get the technical experts together with the operational experts 
Um, uh, we just recently released a new tool. It's also publicly available. You can take a look at it. Um, in coordination with uh, Google Ideas, now Jigsaw, and Storyful. And it allows you to create collaborative playlists of videos and tag it with a couple of different people. Now, um, by my own calculations, the number of videos, or actually the minutes of videos, uh, of video content coming out of Syria outnumbers the minutes of real time. So the conflict's been going over for, for over five years. We have well over five years worth of video content. Um, which is an incredible resource. Even just the fact that we can begin to think of monitoring a cessation of, of hostilities digitally, remotely, um, represents a major, major shift in the way in which conflicts are being waged.